Christy Carl Gala. I'm a direct descendant of John Dillinger. While rummaging through my parents' stuff the other day in the garage, I found this cassette tape, and it says John Dillinger's cousin on it. It's his first cousin. It's an actual account of all the events of John Dillinger's life because he grew up with him. This isn't a story. This is fact. This is from my relatives. My great-grandfather's name is John Dillinger. So this is the real thing. The guy grew up with him. It's an old tape. It's dated 1972. It was his first cousin. And it he talks about the entire event of John Dillinger's life from beginning to end. It's really interesting. Sit back and listen. I hope you enjoy it. This is not a story. This is actual facts. benefit of young people especially and for the information that may be gained from the knowledge of the consequences of the things that occur in life and the joys, the sorrows and the mistakes that we find so many, many times. My grandfather was born in France, near the little town of Metz, where lived the family of the Dillingers, from which I have descended. The family living there, so far as I am able to understand and to obtain, and I have done all the research that I can find on this family, was that my grandfather left Metz, France when he was 14 years old, obtaining passage on a, on a freighter as a cabin boy to get to the United States. He was coming to this country to find an older brother who had preceded him. This happened about the time or shortly after the time of the wars of Napoleon and it is quite possible that their father was dead or had escaped into sanctuary in some other country. The older son of the family of four, which was two boys and two girls, had left and come to the United States possibly to escape military draft. As we have researched to the best of our ability why he had come, there is little information that has ever been available and what became of him after he arrived in this country is difficult to tell. I'll have more to say about this in a little while. Going back to the family of two boys, two girls, a father missing, and a mother caring for the family. Working with their hands in the field to make and to acquire enough sustenance to sustain themselves in life. The older boy had left, and it was decided then by the mother and two daughters to accumulate enough money to buy the second boy, my grandfather, passage on this steamer. Upon arriving in the United States, he was at a loss as to how to talk to people, knowing only the French language, and where to go to look for his father. It is amazing to me that in his search he did find the pathway that was taken by his older brother. Leaving New York shortly after arrival, he worked in Pennsylvania, and there they taught him, beside the French language, the language of the German, some Dutch and some English. As he worked his way through that part of the country toward the the state of Indiana, he uh, had acquired a great deal of knowledge, a great deal of experience, and had somewhat become Americanized. He arrived 
arrived in Indianapolis after several years of experience and continued on through the state of Indiana to the city of Terre Haute where he lost permanently the trail of his brother. Going back to Indianapolis, he settled down in the southeast corner of Marion County working for a farmer from whom he had uh, acquired employment. While working on this farm, he became well acquainted with the family, which was uh, a man, his wife, and two daughters. The older of the two daughters became quite friendly with him and in later years were married. This was the beginning of the Dillinger family, as it is known in the United States. After this marriage, they worked uh, throughout the harvest, worked around the city of Indianapolis, primarily in the country, acquiring what labor they could to make a meager living. As they grew older, of course, they had offspring. In fact, they had 13 children, only seven of which lived. Among them was my father, the father of John Dillinger, and some of the others not necessary to mention in this recording. My father was interested in carpentry. He married my mother in Indianapolis, or near Indianapolis. He was a carpenter by trade. Early in their married life, they decided to live, leave Indianapolis and move to Putnam County, Indiana. In Putnam County, I was the first child born to this family. They had three children prior to coming to Putnam County. I was raised in Putnam County in the hill country, of which I I'm not ashamed, which to me was one of the finest periods of time and experiences that a boy could have. One of the things that was perplexing to me in my early life was the relationship between my father and especially his oldest brother, John Sr., in Indianapolis. We were always good friends but there was always that difference between poor people and people of better circumstances. In visiting uh, Indianapolis, the first journey I can remember from Greencastle to Indianapolis was when I was four years old, my father hitched a team of horses to a carriage, and we made the journey leaving at midnight from Putnam County and arriving at sundown in the northern part of Indianapolis where my uncle John lived. This was uh, of great interest to me. It was the first I could remember of Indianapolis. The family lived in a nice home. My uncle was a grocerman. He ran a grocery store which kept him very busy because at that time they kept the store open 12 hours a day, seven days a week. But my interest was sincere in knowing the family and the acquaintance. It was rather perplexing to me that people could live in what luxury I thought they were living in, which now I know was not so luxurious. But to have uh, the privilege of being in the family and living with the family for several days, I learned a great deal about the family. At this time, John was only two years old. I was well acquainted and became a good friend or close friend of my cousin who married later in life. But having lost their mother, 
two years after the birth of John. They were at a loss to have the benefit of a mother in the family. In later years, as I've become to know them well and visited them more often, I came in contact with John as he began to grow up. John was an impetuous boy, restless. He disliked his older sister being the mother over him. He resented any of her instructions. His father, having lost the mother, was somewhat sympathetic and possibly too much so toward the son. But they could uh, control him as they should have in the proper manner. One of my early remembrances of John and his boyhood was one time when we went to the state fair. Johnny was then about uh, eight years old. When we got to the fairgrounds, although John always had plenty of money because his father kept him supplied with enough money for any boy and possibly too much money. He went to the gate rather than buy a ticket. He went off to the side where a bunch of young boys that wanted to get in the fair and didn't have the money were awaiting, hoping to have an opportunity to enter. John immediately began a quarrel with them, got them into a wrangle, into a boyhood fight. When the fight was at its pitch, Johnny slipped around the gate and into the fair without having to pay any entrance fee because the guards at the gate had gone to stop the fight between the boys. This gives you some idea of the early life of John and sufficiently to give you some idea of what he would be like as he grew up up as he did in these circumstances, uh, he was left to run the streets as he pleased. He stayed out rather late at night many times. Although seemingly never in very much trouble, he dominated the boys' gang in that part of Indianapolis. As the years went by and he grew older, in later years when he came down into Putnam County with his father sometimes to go hunting. He was quite uh, uh, difficult to talk to, quite difficult to get along with because he thought he knew everything. But on the farm he was afraid of the horses, afraid of the cows, and this widened the breach between he and myself. Although we were near the same age. As time went on, John became much more interested in the other side of the tracks. And by this I mean that part of Indianapolis which tended toward criminal practices. He would uh, steal when he needed not to because his father, as I said, gave him plenty of money. But as his life went on there, he became more and more impetuous and began to organize a gang that later became one of the most uh, cunning and possibly the most destructive of any boys gang that ever lived in Indianapolis beyond this point now to pick up his story as most people would like to know it. We begin, we begin now with the, with the boy as he reached closer to manhood. In his early manhood, he associated with criminals. He ran with criminals, they robbed stores, they broke into various places and took whatever they wanted. They didn't see it worthwhile to buy anything that they wanted. 
This all occurred within Marin County, and this being true, the federal authorities had no, no right and had no excuse to come into the city to investigate. As this went on and, the, the, and things grew worse, they began to travel out into the county and finally crossed the county line, and this brought the FBI into the picture. But it was a long time from then to, until the apprehension of John Dillinger. John was seen. I saw him two or three times when I would be in Indianapolis. One time at the intersection of Meridian and Washington, riding in a big limousine in between two of his henchmen. They drove down through the street. The police then were, of course, the signalers for the traffic, since there were no traffic lights at that time. And I was amazed to see, as I looked across the intersection, that when that car went through the intersection, every policeman had his back turned toward the car. I think they knew, and I think they were aware of what was going on. But seemingly, they were at loss as to what to do about it. Following this, uh, this gives a picture of some of his life. More and more he began to reach out into other territories. More and more the police began to hunt him. And uh, on one occasion when he was uh, having a robbery or a robbery, leading a robbery, I should say. Uh, they became entangled with the law, but they escaped that time. One of the interesting things that I remember uh, primarily was that they came down to Greencastle, which is the county seat of Putnam County. They put on a show. They made it as a show, which it really was. They proposed to the city people that they would show them and would film a bank robbery. The First National Bank agreed to cooperate with them. They set up everything. They ran through all of the practices, had everything uh, arranged the way they wanted it. The public gathered on both sides of the street and on around the square to see what was going on. When they left that evening, they told them they would be back to put on the final performance. Upon arrival the next morning, they entered the bank, but this time with submachine guns. This time they robbed the bank of all the money that was there, went out, in their masquerade as they had the day before, loaded the money in the automobiles and took off for Indianapolis. Not until some people went into the bank after the door was left open did they find the cashiers tied with their hands behind them and gagged. And they cut them loose and they knew then what had happened. This is some of the ingenuity that this man had. Although he used it in the wrong way, he could have been a very brilliant person. This set the FBI on his track. But as I said before, he was hard to catch. He traveled eastward out of Indianapolis. He went over into Ohio. While in Ohio there, he was arrested and put in jail. But this was a misfortune for the jailer. That night, sometime in the night, two of his henchmen out of Indianapolis drove over to into Ohio to the little town where he was in jail, shot the sheriff, broke the jail open, and brought John back to Indiana. This was the straw that broke the camel's back so far as Indiana was concerned because he had to leave Indiana. Then he began to rove over the Midwest, robbing and uh, covering anything that he could get. He went to Chicago, he went up through, uh, up into upper Wisconsin, back 
down into uh, some of the uh, some of the towns, or so, I should say, some of the states south and west. Came back down through St. Louis and back into Indiana from the west. All this time, there was always an incident in the paper of the robbing of a bank. It had become a household word to the press to attribute it to John Dillinger, whether it was his or not. Most likely, it was his. The next time that I knew of him, they had apprehended him again and had uh, sent him over to Pendleton, Indiana, which is a reformatory since he was not 21 yet. They sent him to the reformatory and put him in that hard labor, kept him inside the reformatory. I happened to be working at that time over near uh, Pendleton, in fact, just on the east side, doing electrical construction work, which was uh, transformers and substations. It was convenient and, and profitable to the company for me to have the crushed stone that was to be used on the yard purchased from the reformatory, which had a large quarry. When the first driver came in, all of whom were trustees, I asked him, uh, when I signed the ticket and he looked at my name, I asked him if he knew John, and he said yes. He left then, and when he returned with the next load, after two other loads had been unloaded, as he drove into the lot, I pitched a package of cigarettes into the truck seat, because I had learned long before then that this was the way to get rock spread as evenly as if you used a level on it. And I stepped up into the truck and asked the driver about John. He said that John was preparing to escape. I was not sure whether he knew what he was talking about, but I was halfway fearful that he did. It was only a few hours later that I found that the and heard the whistles at the reformatory uh, sound, and I knew from the sound of it, having been around that part of the country some, that that meant an escape. John escaped and went up to Crown Point. I had told my wife that I thought on Saturday I might drive up to Crown Point because he was in jail there. I was glad I didn't because when he arrived at Crown Point, he had been apprehended and put in jail. But now I believe that it was purposely done, not on the other people's part, but on his part. He was put in jail with a Negro. The next morning, the sheriff of that county having been killed in the line of duty. His wife had taken over his duties to, for the remainder of his term. That morning, the sheriff's car was sitting out in front of the uh, housing with the engine running. It was time for the feeding of the prisoners. On the reached the prison's door and unlocked it. They were met with two guns, were whipped with a pistol whipped and locked in jail. The Negro and John went directly to the car, got in it, and drove away before ever anyone knew what was happening. They crossed the line in the Illinois. There John left the Negro out, and he went headed for Chicago. So far as I know, they never met again, neither did I ever hear of the Negro again. But John then began to rove the western part of the central states, uh, always fi 
finding someone to rob, finding some way to get money. Later on, he came back and married. He left Indiana again and went back uh, up into northern Wisconsin, through northern Wisconsin. And uh, if you remember any of the story or have any, heard any of the story, was lodged at the little Bohem Bohemian Lodge in northern Wisconsin. This is not far from the Flambeau Floyd, which is up in the old ironworks country. They were hidden out there for a while and then went to Milwaukee, where they were apprehended, but in the gun duel, they escaped, killing one man, yet being wounded themselves slightly. The next we knew of them was that these two men that were traveling now together, which was uh, Party Boy Floyd and John Dillinger, that uh, they were headed for the southwest. John had told his father that if ever he accumulated a hundred thousand dollars, he would uh, start a cattle ranch down in, uh, in uh, Mexico. The next I knew of them, they were in uh, the southwest. We heard of them having arrived there uh, through the police reports. They had stopped in Phoenix, Arizona, had stayed overnight, and uh, they had rented private rooms in homes in the suburbs. But the, the fatal mistake was that one of them caught fire. With the call of the with the call of the uh, fire department and the uh, things that occurred, the police coming along with them. John and this other man were apprehended and brought back to Indiana for trial. When they had them back for trial, it was not, they were not in jail too long until they escaped again. But this time, the FBI was hot on their tracks. It was uh, pathetic to learn of the hunt, which was more like the hunt of an animal, for an animal, than the hunt for a human being. Every law officer was advised to kill. Having come back to Indiana, John escaped from prison again and went to Chicago. The only hope he had for survival now was to get in touch with the mob of Chicago, which were dominant in the city at that time. When he arrived there, he took up residence and lived under the jurisdiction of these men. And it was quite evident to my knowledge that uh, he would not live long. The night in which he was killed was a pathetic scene, but it was a predetermined massacre. John and a lady friend of his had gone to the, the Bayou Theater up in northern Chicago. The plan had been set up. And I think Capone had made the arrangements and had notified the authorities. They went into the theater, watched the film run the first time, stayed for the second running of the film, and came out of the theater. As they came out into the lights under the marquee, John's lady friend grabbed him by the arm and said, my God, man, look, my God, John, look at those men. They were FBI men lined up along the street, cars and all. 
John made a dash to the west, the theater facing the south, into the alley that was not far from the theater. He got about 10 feet into the alley, and the submachine guns were turned loose. One of them began right about the middle of his back at the waist, and as he fell forward, it almost cut him in two to the top of his head. As he laid there, awaiting the call for the coroner, a young Negro came out with an armload of handkerchiefs out of a store across the street, dipped them in the blood, and was selling them as fast as he could sell them for five dollars a piece until he ran out of handkerchiefs. This was the end of John Dillinger. As I think of it, and as I remember it, and I don't like to think of it often, the body was brought back after it had been taken to a place in, in, in Chicago where they even took off the top of the skull and examined his brain. When he got back to Mooresville, which was the home of his parents at this time, he didn't look much like a human being. At the time of the funeral, I was, uh, I had come home from the southern Indiana. I picked up my wife and my mother with intention of going to the funeral. I felt quite sure that uh, we ought to go for the benefit of his relatives. We arrived early. We found that the police had cordoned off four blocks square every direction from the home of his sister where he lay in the coffin. We entered the house about an hour before time for the procession to leave the building. We talked with the relatives. Mother saw for the first time what he looked like after all of this had happened. My wife and I talked to some of the other people there. In the meantime, the police came to me since I was pretty well acquainted with some of the police having worked in Indianapolis considerably and asked me to put my car at the rear of the procession when they left the house. As the funeral service began, and began to crowd against the house to where about every 10 or 15 minutes you would hear a window pane break where people were pushing against other people, almost pushing them into the house. At the end of the short service, we were unable to leave the house. A call was made for more police and they brought the riot squad out and opened a pathway where we could carry the often from the front door of the house out to the street. The coffin was put in the hearse and it was pulled to the front end of the procession, which was 46 cars. Each one of them tagged and numbered so every policeman on the route to the cemetery would know that it was a relative. As we left and my car was at the rear at the request of the police, it had four funeral flags on the back bumper. This was to indicate to all police that when we passed them, that that was the end of the procession and they were to, at all possible, cut off the mass of people that were trying to follow. We proceeded on then toward the north on the west side of Indianapolis. We were, the funeral was on the southwest side. We went north for quite some distance, about five times before we got 
near the cemetery. The police had to stop the procession, go down the line, force, forcibly force, those who had gotten into the line by just crowding somebody out of place and get them out of the procession and then we would proceed. When we reached the gates of Crown Hill, we thought possibly that the worst was over. We entered the gate on the west side. We had to drive through the southern part of the cemetery, turn north to the northwest corner where the barrel would be. As we got into the gates, the gates were shut and locked. The cemetery had not been opened that morning as it has always been before, had always been before and has always been since. As we drove through the cemetery at a rather slow pace, we could see the crowds running around the iron fence all the way around trying to follow and to find where the barrel would be. We drove into the northwest part, parked the cars, and went to the hearse. The grave had been dug. Everything was ready for the burial. We took the coffin from the hearse carried it to the lowering device and set it down on the lowering device, ready for a short ceremony. As we stood aside there for this to happen, and before the minister could say more than five words, seven sections of the iron fence, which is on top of the stone wall, was broken over by the crowd on the east side and they came ra raging across the cemetery like a herd of wild animals. As they went by, or as they approached rather, the man with the, with the funeral service managed to lower the coffin just below ground level. As the crowd went by, they grabbed every flower, and it had taken eight carloads to carry all the flowers that were sent for that funeral. Going across the cemetery on a dead run, boys, girls, men, old women, old men, black, white, didn't make any difference, like a herd of cattle. When the flowers were gone, they began grabbing clods of dirt. They almost carried away enough clods that there weren't enough to fill the grave. Finally, they were gone. The lowering device was reactivated. The coffin was put in the ground, and immediately, they had arranged by telephone for one of the cement mixing companies to bring a load of concrete and dump immediately upon the box, which was done. Then the dirt was pushed in on top of the grave. It was over. It's, it was something hard for me to realize. I was stunned. I slept little that night or for two or three nights afterward. But peace had come to the Dillinger family at that time. As I think back over the period of time that this has occurred and the things that followed, I have been to the grave many times. I have many times escorted people through the cemetery to see the beauties 
that can be seen there. Little do they realize that with the beauties that are visible there, of the heartaches, the sorrows and misfortunes that are buried there. I've taken a number of people past the grave, also to the burial place of James Whitcomb Riley, Indiana's famous poet. But it's a pleasure to me in some ways to tell a story that it might be helpful to others. Thank you for the privilege of relating this.